I'm sweating profusely. I have a banging headache, I'm shaking, and I cannot put a sentence together. I know from past experience I'm going through DTs, delirium tremors, and it means if I don't get alcohol into my system within the next 10, 20, 30 minutes, I could go into convulsions and I probably would die. So I'm in this condition outside the store. The storekeeper knows me, not supposed to serve alcohol till 10, but he knows I'm in a condition. I walked in, I put my 10 pounds on the counter, and I said, can I have a bottle of vodka? He had it all ready for me. He put, the, put it on the counter, and this was my reaction that morning. <sighs> my shake stopped, my sweating stopped, my headache went away immediately, and my mood, mood changed like that. I remember looking at the bottle, looking at the shopkeeper, looking back at the bottle, and thinking to myself, oh my goodness, it's not the alcohol. It's me. It's my brain. Okay, life can be crazy. You're feeling like you're sinking. Just trying to find a meaning. It's time for better thinking. Yeah, better thinking. Time to tune in. Let's go. Welcome back to Better Thinking. My name is Nesh Nikolic and today's guest is Dr. Rob Kelly. He specializes in working with people with addiction and also alcoholism. What's really interesting about Rob is his own journey and lived experience with alcohol and how it's been destructive in his life. It's a high energy interview. Rob is a high energy guy, so you're going to really enjoy this. There's certainly a lot to, to learn and also to appreciate how you can see potentially some of Rob's own personality has been both his great superpower in recovery, but also his kryptonite in stepping into this world of alcohol, alcoholism and destruction. Enjoy this episode. Rob Kelly, a big thank you for coming on to the show. My pleasure, Nash. It's great to be here. I'm looking forward to this. Look, one of the reasons why I, I had my team sort of reach out to, to you is to talk about not only your experience in, in helping others with addiction and the like, but also I know that you've got lived experience and that's something that, uh, you know, not, 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 not all of us go out and have who are in the helping profession. And so I, I wanted to kind of compliment both those worlds, you know, all, all the learnings that, that you have from, from your own studies uh, all the way through, and your experience, obviously, all the way through to what you've learned as a human being, you know, in, in lived experience. Um, so I was, I, was, I was hoping we might sort of find out a little bit about you first uh, um, or maybe we weave both into to, together, but I, I think it's good for the audience to understand who, who Rob is. Definitely. Well, uh, my name's Rob Kelly. I, uh, I'm from Manchester in the United Kingdom, but I'm uh, currently residing and have done for 14 years in Texas. I actually live in San Antonio, Texas. And uh, I have a fantastic life here. It's always sunny. It's beautiful. I go back to England to visit now and again. <clears throat> uh, I just got contact with my daughter. We'll get into that later. But I go to visit her two or three times a year. And my beautiful granddaughter. But I love it here. Um, got into addiction and helping people because I'm a chronic alcoholic myself. I recovered from the disease of alcoholism. But I'm still, I'm still an alcoholic and I still have to trade. So I still work on myself today. I have four practices around the world. Uh, I do TV, books, I do podcasts, uh, I do all that great stuff to help people. And basically, I'm, I'm in this deal to, to help the suffering alcoholic or addict and their families. And it's very important that I say family because when I was going through my own suffering, nobody introduced the family and my family had no idea what, what I was going through. And I didn't know any idea because I'd go to doctors and nurses and you know psychologists and they were all baffled with alcoholism. And addiction and that's where I came into my own about 25 26 years ago when I decided to study the brain regarding the disease and why is it that a it's a dirty disease and B we can't just stop doing this horrible thing that seems to hurt me and other people around me why is it I can't stop because everything else in my life when I touch it turns to gold and yet the alcoholism for me kept knocking me down every single time. So I was intrigued by it. So I went, I kind of went around it in an aggressive way, as in I studied 12, 13 hours a day for 15 years, maybe, just on the brain. What is it in the brain that we're missing? Why is, is, is uh, we're still locked down on as alcoholics who can't stop drinking? And, and what's really going on? That's what I wanted to know, what's really going on. 
And what were some of the things that you found out in, in these studies? What, obviously, at that point, you were complementing uh, your, your lived experience and, and trying to make sense of it all. Um, what, 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 what did you make of it all? The, big, the biggest surprise for me was it wasn't the alcohol. Alcoholism is my primary disease. So when I say that, I talk about addiction and everything. But let me just say alcohol. It wasn't the alcohol. See, I thought it was. I thought if I just stopped drinking, surely my life would get better and everything would be okay. First of all, it's impossible to do on your own if you've gone down to the, as, as far as I did with the addiction, right into chronic alcoholism. And, and secondly, you know, it's, it's got very little to do with alcohol. And, and this, is, this was my aha moment. <clears throat> so this is halfway through my suffering. I'm outside a liquor store at 6 a.m. They also sell newspapers and milk and stuff like that. But uh, I'm outside at 6 a.m. in the morning. I have a T-shirt on, a pair of shorts and a pair of flip-flops. It's probably 10 below. It's snowing. It, the wind is crazy. I'm sweating profusely. I have a banging headache. I'm shaking. And I cannot put a sentence together. I know from past experience I'm going through DTs, delirium tremors. And it means if I don't get alcohol into my system within the next 10, 20, 30 minutes, I could go into convulsions and I probably would die. So I'm in this condition outside the store. The storekeeper knows me, not supposed to serve alcohol till 10, but he knows I'm in a condition. I walked in, I put my 10 pounds on the counter and I said, can I have a bottle of vodka? He had it all ready for me. He put, the, put it on the counter and this was my reaction that morning. My shake stopped, my sweating stopped, my headache went away immediately, and my mood, mood changed like that. I remember looking at the bottle, looking at the shopkeeper, looking back at the bottle, and thinking to myself, oh my goodness, it's not the alcohol. It's me, it's my brain. There come the saying, I don't have a drinking problem, I have a thinking problem. Because all my body had gone into relaxed mode, all the symptoms of DTs had gone away. How, how on earth would that happen? All, all control with the mind. As soon as I know I had it, the body relaxed, the headaches went, all the ailments of DTs disappeared without even opening the bottle, without opening the cap. And it was right there and then I thought, we need to do some more research on this. If I ever get off the streets, I'm going to spend the rest of my life finding out what's really going on with alcoholism. And that's what I've done. What do you think would have happened if the bottle was then taken away from you again before you take a sip? What an absolutely amazing question. First of all, nobody's asked me that question. Oh, my goodness. I reckon I would have gone back to the, to the original state 30, 40 seconds ago. Probably. Wow. That, I have, I've told that story hundreds of thousands of times. Over the last 27 years, nobody's ever asked that question. Wow, I wonder what would have happened. I like to think that it'd go back, but wow, what a great, what a great question. I don't know. Kind of throwing. Really, I'm, I'm very rarely without words, but that, that's kind of from That's a great question, Nesh. It poses some wow. difficult questions because I, I know with a lot of my, 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 my clients who are in similar sort of scenarios, the moment they know they're going to, you know, get their fix, whatever it might be. Um, that calm that comes upon them shows up uh, and, and, you know, often it's well before they even take it. You know, it's not even necessarily always at the counter. It can be driving to, you know, their, 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 their dealer, so to speak, um, which could be 25 minutes away, but, but you know, cause it's organized and the phone call is made and they're, they're meeting somewhere and they've got the cash. You know, they, they are relieved and, and, and there's a sense of re, re, relief that comes with knowing. Um, similarly with even social anxiety, someone knows that when, when, when they're leaving that environment, um, yeah. even though they're not out yet, they can't be done. A few months ago, and it was more into, exactly right what you said, it was more intoxicating to them to drive to the drug dealer than it was to take the drug once they got there. 95% was more intoxicating driving there, which again kind of proves my point. It's not the drug or the alcohol, it's really me. So what's really going on with me? And that's the question that's really get asked with alcoholism because we see the symptom. If we see a cancer patient with cancer, we see the disease, then we see the person. With alcoholism, we see the symptom, and then we see the person. 
So why can't you just stop taking? Why, why, just stop for your kids. Just, my goodness, enough is in. They, they have no idea what's going on. Both are sick people. Both cannot get well on their own. And we both have a terminal illness. Myself, I'm a cancer patient. But you get loads of cards on the cancer patient's uh, table. On mine, there'll be nothing. No one wishes me well. Get well soon, Rob. Everything's going to be okay. Nothing. It's all negative comments of why I would do this to my family. And that's the stigma that I wanted to break when I first came into the industry. We've worked with some of the biggest and best movie stars, footballers, musicians in the world. And we always try and get them to come out after and go, hey, you know, let's talk about it. But nobody will. You know, they come in anonymously and they go anonymously. And that's their choice. We, you know, we will stand by that. But we just want to get it out there by saying, hey, guys, especially parents and loved ones, this is not something that you should sweep under the carpet. Because my parents did that. And look what happened to me. You know, when, if, you, if, you, if you are seeing signs of early addiction or alcoholism within the family unit, you need to get help as soon as possible from a professional who knows what he's talking about. Now, there in itself lies a, lies a question because the medical fraternity are still baffled with alcoholism. So where do we go? You know, where do we go? And we're, we're actually setting up a foundation at the moment which will gold stamp treatment centers and uh, psychologists and therapists that are really in this industry for the right reasons. Because we've seen and heard so many uh, war stories and so many crazy stories about people are just in this for the finances. There's so many sober houses opening up. Florida was crazy. And, and of course, LA about all these people earning millions of dollars on the back of sick people. And we just wanted to stop that. And uh, we will do anything in our power to make sure that when the average person picks the phone up, you can actually trust what the other person's saying. We've turned down more people than we've taken on. You have to pass an assessment to come with us. And if, if I'm not 100% sure that I can get you to a place where you have a life beyond your wildest dreams and don't take drugs or drink alcohol again, I'm not going to touch you. I'm sorry, but I'm not going to do it. And, and we will stick by that to the day I die because this isn't about the money. This is about a mission that I started 27 years ago and I'm not finished yet. And we'll continue for another 27, God willing, to make sure that everybody I come across has a chance to recover. Before I ask you about that mission of yours, can you tell me a little bit about how you uh, found yourself you know, drinking? You know, what, what, what was your first introduction? How did that all occur for you? I was, I was born into a musical family, my auntie and uncle, grandfather, um, all musicians, but I went on stage with my uncle and auntie at the age of nine or ten, and uh, huge. Imagine going on stage every weekend with your, with your siblings. I was a very nervous kid, and we played a big venue. It's actually Liverpool, in Liverpool, where the Beatles come from. But we played a venue there, and there were so many people. I just got stage fright. And my uh, my uncle said, "Here, take a couple of mouthfuls of this beer." So I did, and I, I drank half a glass of it. And my whole world changed right there and then. And I knew that I found something that I was going to use for the rest of my life to become famous and become uh, everything that I wanted to do, become rich, speak to girls, all this great stuff, especially when I went into my teens. So that's where my drinking set off. I truly believe with my research that uh, we are born this way. Alcoholics are born. They are not made. You can't drink yourself into becoming an alcoholic. It's an impossibility. It's something mapped out in my brain. It's hereditary. You can trace it back in your family. We have the addictive gene in the brain. And once you have it, it forms uh, self-sabotaging neural pathways. And that with the mapping of the brain whilst child uh, ends up for devastation like it did with me. So I, that was my first drink. I drank every weekend after that, just this little half pint of beer. And then as I went through my teens, obviously increased and finally, you know, I ended up on vodka, uh, functioning for many years on vodka. Uh, I did loads of other things as well. I remember uh, I always wanted to be a musician. That was my main thing I wanted to do. So I got a job at a, a, a studio, a recording studio. Back in the days, this is senses, back in the days when we used to record instruments to play jingles on TV and radio, that's what I did. So I auditioned for a place in Stockport, Manchester, which was Abbey, oh, sorry, which was uh, Strawberry Studios, which was 10CC's recording studio. And we did a lot of work there. And then at probably 16, 17, I applied for Abbey Road. And I remember going down to Abbey Road on my first audition. 
and I was a bit nervous, obviously, because it was uh, it was a big place. And I, I looked at the, there used to be a news agent a block away from the studio, and they sold beer. And I remember buying a beer at the age of 16, 17, and, and thinking, if I have this interview, I'll drink this beer, I should be okay. And I did. I drank the beer and I went in, went back home, waited for the letter through the mail. Uh, I found, I got the job, I got the first uh, audition. So second time I went, uh, I did the same. I got two beers for the second audition. Then I got a third audition, so I got three beers for the third audition. I had seven auditions for that job. So by the time I went in on my seventh audition, I had seven beers outside Abbey Road, chugging them down, and went in. And I could hardly remember what I did. It was just a blur. But when I got home a couple of weeks later, the letter arrived that I'd got the position of the bass player at Abbey Road. So what that told me was alcohol was working for me and that this was going to make me famous. And I played with Queen, Elton John, Bowie, all them guys, you know, whilst, whilst in, my, uh, in my disease. But obviously through time and lots of other things that happened to me, it finally turned on me and uh, it was never the same since. It sounds like there was a lot of reinforcement from a young age that, that just incidentally occurred, whether it be your uncle saying, take a couple of mouthfuls of these or, um, you know, the fortune or luck, maybe even misfortune of, of uh, yeah. being able to have one beer and then two and then three as, as you subsequently went through the auditions. Do, do, do you think that had a role to play? I know that you mentioned that you, you believe it's, you know, it, it's, hereditary, it's a disease, it, it, it's something you're born with. Is there that nurture component as well? I definitely think so. I think any, any alcoholic journey that leaves out the childhood, the nurturing, the trauma, um, is, is, is doomed to failure with research. We have to look at that. Now, whether I took a bit at the age of nine or 19, it makes no difference to me. Sooner or later, the alcoholism would have kicked off when I tasted beer. Now, uh, even though it's the only self-diagnosed disease, something that I came up with because 10 DUIs does not make you an alcoholic or a warning from the doctor it doesn't make you an alcoholic it's an internal thing that you know that once you start you can't stop and that's what we need to look at is when I start drinking can I stop and usually the answer is no I can't stop abruptly and walk away I have to have more so you have to look at all them components um, I know alcoholics that never drank alcohol but they have all the traits and, the, and the, the, all the traits of the alcoholic. And they're usually very successful in this. Usually high-powered people who, who are go-getters, you know, they vision something, they walk over and they take, they take that vision and, and they run with it because the alcoholic brain is such an immense organ that, that can absolutely achieve anything that it wants to once it's put its mind to it. But because we're brought up with the childhood trauma of get off there, you stupid idiot, don't do that. How many times have I told you, you clown? You know, all these screaming and shouting that happens in the family household, um, the brain gets damaged and we don't, we don't step out and carry these feats on that we want to do. We look at any kid, they'll tell you straight away what they want to be when they grow up. But by the time they grow up, they've got no confidence to be that singer, that fireman, that pop star, because it's, it's been taken out of us by, by the real world. The idea is to go back and clear that. We call it go back to the scene of the crime. You see, if, if, any, if any listener or viewer is listening to this, if you don't think good enough, if you don't think you are good enough, if you don't think that you can achieve, if you don't think you are worthy, I want to apologize, guys. Somebody put that there. Because this isn't normal human being thinking. Somebody has put that there in your mind, telling you that you are not worthy and you can't do this. I'm here to tell you categorically that that is a lie. It's a blatant lie that somebody used to bring you down for whatever reason and probably didn't even know they were doing it. It's a defense mechanism for some people, but if they can put another human being down or stand taller or shout down to somebody, they will always do that in certain circumstances, especially childhood circumstances. Now, we take that on board and we keep that, and we store it in our subconscious brain. And for the layman, it's a bit like a computer. We stick it in the zip file. And we don't touch that stuff at all. And we don't go back to it. And we don't want to talk about it. And what happens is later on in life, sooner or later, somebody's messing around on that screen with a mouse and clicks that zip file and out it comes. And if it comes out all at once, not many people can handle that. And that's why we have to go back and clear that up. There are, there, there are some traits that I 
anecdotally have uh, have seen for for uh, you know people with addiction, and I'm certainly no expert by any means. But one of the things that I see is is high level of impulsivity, um, and that 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 probably also ties into why you know many are so so uh, and and also go getters uh, uh, many are so successful. Um, there, there, there's really successful people who, whether it be you know with alcohol or or other other, other forms of drugs, there's something about this high energy, high volume, go go go, and it, and it ends up appearing like it's an impulsivity or excitement. There's this kind of a dra- adrenal rush of of I want more out of life, um, and you know if, if someone tastes that that more in in, in a substance, it, it, it's quite easily followed. Um, is is any of that your experience? That's just my antidotal. I'm certainly you know, that, that that's not my uh, uh, my um, you know specialty, so to speak. Yeah, it is. You're spot on when you say that. Uh, many of us do that, and we do, and we do it to uh, excess most of the times. It's kind of getting the deal done, you know. He's just like, let's do this, let's get it done. You know, it's not rocket science, and that way of thinking gets results. The other thing is as well is more, most alcoholics, either drinking or not, especially not drinking, are not really fearful of anything. Those who have drinking and recovered, that's definitely not fearful of anything. So don't take chances; other people won't. You see, fear is a big component to the to the human being. Fear will stop us from achieving our dreams. We make practical decisions based on fear. I heard a guy once speaking, and he said that his, his, uh, his father was a great architect, and he had a chance to go on and be a comedian or something, or, or some stage, I think he was a comedian, and um, he took the sensible, practical decision to stay with his architect firm and, and work as an architect, and he turned down the opportunity to appear on TV. Now, the guy took his place become a multi-millionaire on tv big star in the uk and six months later after the decision the architect company let him let his father go and that for me sums everything up in life is if if you're going to fail at something you don't want to do might as well fail at something you do want to do and put the fear behind you and step forward and try these impulse now there is a flip side to that we've got to watch for bipolar every alcoholic i see suffers from depression Every alcoholic I see has some sort of bipolar or, or, or mood. Uh, I like to say it's a mental injury, not mental illness. Mental injury. Uh, and so we have to be careful of that. But definitely the, the traits of the, of the alcoholic, uh, you know, let's get it done. Let's do it. We, you know, what we've got to do this. Uh, it's quick. It's fast. And they're always looking for the next, the next thing to do. Most of my patients take up a hobby. And it's so funny now because one of them plays a guitar. And after about three months, he had mastered that guitar. Like he could play any song that you threw at him, and he was amazing at it. Then he puts it down, never touches it ever again, and moves on to the next thing. And he'll probably become a master at that. But then, we, and then we don't. We're great starters, but we're terrible finishers. And, and and anybody out there who's an employer will know this. If you've started anybody, it's a drink or drug problem. Oh my goodness, they are looking good at the interview. They look amazing at the second interview. The first couple of weeks, it is your star employee. You're telling everybody you need to be like this guy. But over any considerable period, we get worse, never better. And we always end up flunking it in the end. What are the what, what are the contributors out, out there? I'm I'm a bit of a fan of uh, some of the work. Uh, I think one of your fellow fellow um, countrymen, Johan Hari, who, who talks about sort of the the – Importance of connection, the importance of belonging. Uh, that 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 uh, many who go down the trap, you know, or, or find themselves in addiction, have in many ways been disconnected from from many things. Not not only socially, but you know, purpose, um, you know, uh, drive and the like. What, what do you make of, of of that? I'm not sure if you're familiar with Johan Hari's work. A little, but I, I get the disconnection. It's you see, when somebody looks at alcoholism and the alcoholic, they go, well, you just stop drinking and that's it, we're good. No, we have a disconnect. We either have a disconnect with God, a higher power, supreme being, whatever you want to call it, a disconnect with human beings as well. Isolation is good. This pandemic is great for the alcoholic. We don't want to speak to anybody. We don't want to mix with anybody. This is our prime time. So the, 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 the cut off from every other people. We're social animals. We're meant to converse on a face-to-face basis. But that disconnect is something huge. And many people will tell me that I have a hole here and they'll pat the chest. 
and and I know exactly it's that disconnect from people, from 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 love, from from God, from all these things around you. The Beatles said all we need is love, and I smiled it when I heard the record because I'm not a great fan of the Beatles. But oh my God, the more I go into that word, and I heard someone today say on my podcast, he said to describe the word love, we'd need to look at it under a microscope because this it means so much. And it all comes to disconnect. When I disconnect with God, when I disconnect with the, my, my spiritual being, when I disconnect with spirit, when I disconnect with people that I love, you find yourself in isolation. The isolation of a human being will self-destruct quicker than anything else I know on earth. And if you have a self-sabotaging uh, brain that comes with the alcoholic, we are doomed. We cannot isolate. So we need to be connected. Is there a God? Isn't there a God? Big question. I know for me, some of the stuff I've done in my life to go from homelessness to one of the greatest minds in the modern addiction world is a human impossibility. It's humanly impossible. So I had to have that connection with God. I have to have connection with people that keep me accountable. And I have to have connection with the world. You know, I need to go out in my bare feet and walk on the grass to feel that connection. And, and many people look at the alcohol and say, that's the problem. It's not the problem. And another great question, it's the disconnect that we have with life and, and beings around us that, that can bring us to this, this place of peace and love. Because that's what we say we do. We don't get you sober, anybody can do that. We're gonna get you to a place you've never been before. A place where you can hear the birds singing in the morning and you can walk out and see how green the grass is and see that tree that you've walked past 10 years in a row going to work and never even noticed it existed. When you, once you get there, you start getting connected to some real powerful stuff that I can't explain. There's so many things in my past that's happened to me that I know that there is a God and I'm being looked after. There's so many things that when I want to tell people, the hairs on the back of my neck stand up. Because what are some of those things? Well, when I came off the streets, um, I was on the streets for 14 months and it was a rainy morning and uh, I dropped down to my hands and knees and I started to cry from my belly. Uh, I was crying because I knew I couldn't stop drinking. That's where it took me after all the losses I've had in a year on the streets. I looked up to the sky and said, if there's a God there, I can't do this on my own anymore. And a guy walked around the corner at 2.30 in the morning, took me back to his house, fed me. He said, you've got to come to an AA meeting with me. I'm a Christian, but I'm an alcoholic. So we went there. Anyway, I met this guy that shared. I was supposed to be there, obviously. White hair, white beard, beautiful guy. Had peace. He had peace, Mesh. I mean, you look like the guy that can see someone who has peace. Like, when I look at you, you have peace. It's a beautiful sight when I look at you. This is what that guy looked like. And I walked up to him after the meeting. I said, can you help me? And he said, well, I won't sponsor you, but I'll be your spiritual advisor. Never forget this. For a period of 12 weeks. So... He gave me his address. Uh, he told me to buy a big book and a dictionary. And I walked to that man's house. Couldn't afford bus fare. So I walked to that man's house. It took me an hour to get there. Every Wednesday, we'd do a book study. We'd look for certain words in the, in the book. And we'd cross-reference with the dictionary. <clears throat> and we'd walk an hour back home. So three hours were taken every Wednesday. I did that for 12 weeks. Um, he showed me stuff in that book that, that is powerful. Uh, he told me that God has told me to for me to guarantee people can recover. And he told me all this amazing stuff that blew my mind. When I walked out that man's house on the, on the, on the Sunday, because that's when we did the steps, Saturday and Sunday, I knew that I'd never drink alcohol again, as long as I continued to do what he told me to do. And it was like, be kind to people, compliment people, as well as work my program. About three or four weeks after that, um, I was starting to share this stuff in meetings, and people were blown away. And people were getting well, I was working with people, and people started getting get excited about recovery. So my first paycheck, something like 30 pounds i went to a local gas station i bought him a little card and a teddy bear and i wrote on it something like thank you john you know life is amazing and i walked back to the man's house when i got there there was nobody there and i was knocking that loud that the next door neighbor came out of the apartment and says can i help you and i said can you tell me where john's moved to and she said there's been no one in that apartment for six months so i let her close the door thinking you know okay she's probably been drinking so i walked around to the left hand side and i banged on that door and i'm a little bit nervous and a guy comes to the door and I said, can you tell me where John's relocated to? And he said, there's been no one living there for a year. You've got the wrong address. I never had the wrong address. 
I never found that man. I went back to the meeting there and I said to the people, and I got really angry with them. I nearly had a fight with one of the guys, physical fight, because I was so frustrated. And I was saying, the guy I was speaking to in the corner with the white hair and the white beard, the guy I was speaking to, and they said, Rob, you was in the corner talking to yourself. And I thought this was a conspiracy with all these guys in the room. And I got so angry, I think I threw a chair and I marched out. And it wasn't until weeks and months after, or years after, and I said, I realized who, who that was. And it was some kind of angel that was sent down to teach me stuff. And, and, and there's a hundred more stuff like that. There's, there's loads of stuff that's happened to me that, that makes me know that I'm connected today to a power greater than myself. And it's such an amazing feeling. I mean, the only, the only downside to where I am today and how I walk today and how I feel and how passionate I am about working with people that are suffering is I wish it would have been a lot. I, I wish it would have been 30 and 40 when I got this, you know, and I've, and I've been in the game like 30 years. It all happened like 100 years too late for me. How long were you drinking for? Probably about 15 years, maybe 28 when I stopped drinking. So from 9 to 28 not very good at math, but good 20, 20 years or so, 19 years. So, uh, yeah. And were, were there attempts before that time when you stopped? Were, were you trying and failing? Were, were, were you active in, in, in trying to, to, to go into recovery? Uh, what was that path for you? Like? All the time. All, I, I don't know how many times I, I, I've sworn off. In fact, when I, when I got married, uh, my drinking then started to become every day. I was drinking daily. Vodka, starting at 5 a.m. in the morning when the alarm went off. And my wife got pregnant, and me and my wife, you know, said, Here, here's the deal. I said, when my first daughter's born, I will never drink alcohol again. And I went down to the hospital, and I was in <clears throat> at the birth. And as soon as my daughter, you know, gave it to the wife, and she was holding it. And I had my arm around my wife, and I said, I'm done with drinking. I'm a family man now. Probably lasted about six hours. Didn't last longer. Anyway, years later, we had a second child, two years later. And I took two Bibles to the church, to the uh, hospital. And the, and the second the second child was born, uh, I got two Bibles out and I placed both hands on the Bible and I swore to God, I swore to my wife, and I swore to everybody in that room, including the doctor, that I would never took alcohol again. Seven hours later, I'm drunk at the bar. So I tried many, many times to, to stop, and I, I just couldn't stop. I mean, I literally couldn't stop. And, you know, horrifically, uh, I, I, I do things in blackouts that I just was, just was horrified with. You know, I remember coming down 2.30 in the morning, 3 o'clock in the morning. It was really early in the morning and I was searching for alcohol. And I knew I'd place somebody downstairs in the kitchen. So I found this alcohol, in, you know, like a quarter full. And I put it on the side of the counter for two minutes to turn around to grab a crystal glass because I'm not going to drink out the bottle. I'm not an alcoholic, for God's sake. That's why I kept telling myself. So I'm going to get a crystal glass. But when I turned around to get the glass, my wife would follow me downstairs and she snatched the bottle off the counter. And she said, I think you've had enough. She was probably right. It was my third bottle within 24 hours. I was due to drive to the office in three hours' time. I was well over the legal limit. Instead of thanking her and going back to bed, I took her kitchen off and I found I stabbed her three times. And as she went into, dropped the floor and started bleeding, I called the ambulance and I jumped on the nearest plane to uh, Spain and never come back until she promised me within a turn that she won't press charges. That's the sort of stuff when alcoholism took me to. And um, it was horrific. I never want to go back there again. But it's the, it's the raw truth of, of what happened. When I finally did come back, uh, she had the bags packed and, and she said uh, that, She'll love me till the day she dies, but I'm not killing the kids. And she took my kids off me. And I'm sat in this big house with no children, no wife. And I remember calling my attorney, you know, angry and uh, saying, I need to get, you need to get my kids back here tomorrow. You know, we spend a lot of money with you. I'll give you a check for 25,000 pounds, I think it was. Anyway, the next day he'd been to court early. He knew a favor and he knew somebody else and he got my kids back. And the next day, about 10, 11 o'clock, the doorbell went. And I opened the door and there's my attorney with my two kids, ages one and three. I got a hold of him, I took him in, I gave him his check, I closed the door, and the feeling was absolutely amazing. I said, I got my children back. I watched him into the front room, I sat him down in front of the TV, and I walked into the kitchen, and a thought hit my mind, wouldn't it be great if I just had one beer to celebrate my kids coming back? Three days later, when the police kicked the door down, when the children had not been fed or changed diapers for three days, 
they nearly starved to death. They found me unconscious with vodka bottles strewn around the floor. They kicked me to wake me up and they served me with unfit father papers. And they took my children out of my arms. They walked through the door. I was crying. My wife was crying. The police were crying. It was just a sad sight. And they started walking away from me. And my, my eldest, age three, she turned around and said, Daddy, Daddy, please don't go. And then this, I couldn't say anything. I was just, I was crying. And then halfway down the path, she said, Daddy, Daddy, please get better. And then as he stopped at the gate to open this big gate, to walk out the gate, my daughter turned around one more time and said, Daddy, Daddy, please stop drinking. And I couldn't do it. I just couldn't do it. I closed the door. I walked back into the kitchen, I opened the refrigerator, and I took another beer. Six to seven months after that last beer, the wife and the kids and houses and cars have gone. The business has gone bankrupt. My parents won't speak to me. Friends have disowned me. And I find myself on the streets of Manchester, United Kingdom, penniless, left abandoned and starving to death. And that's where he told me. And you know, the crazy part is, never still thought I had a problem. Never thought I had a problem still. I thought it was a bit of bad luck and everything would be okay. As long as I have my next drink in front of me, everything would be okay. You see, that's the kind of mind that I'm fighting against all the time with other people is, if you put a shot of whiskey when I'm in my addiction, if you put a shot of whiskey on the bar and a loaded gun next to it and said, if you have one, you have to have the other, I'd swallow the whiskey and grab the gun. I don't mind killing myself after I've had that whiskey. And that's when I started to realize that this disease is far more powerful than anybody could ever imagine. And we need to get to the bottom of this. And that's what I've done for the last 27 years. I imagine you've got lots of stories that the, 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 this is one of many. How do you look back at that now? What are your thoughts about that time and the state that you were in, your headspace? How do you reconcile it looking back with sober eyes? Well, at first I was, <clears throat> I was very angry. Then I was very remorseful. Then I was very sad that I'd let everybody down. And I went through this array of emotions over the years. Today, and have been for the last seven or eight years, I look back and I say to myself, the education I got from that was like a semester at Harvard in my industry. To, to, to go through that, to get that education, to, to have been there, to have gone through that and to look somebody else in the eye and say to them, it's going to be okay. I know exactly where you are. And, and they know that you know. And they really do. And so I look back now thinking it was part of my journey. Because many people now will say, well, what would you change? Would you change the homelessness? And I say, no, I really wouldn't. Because I had to go through that to have the compassion and the, and the power for the way I, I approach uh, this, this, this gift that I've been given in such a passionate way that I had to go through that. I had to go through the child abuse. I had to go through the molestation at church. I had to go through my, my, my first breakup, that, my first girlfriend that broke my heart. I had to go through all of that. It was painful. It was horribly painful. And I would never wish this on my worst enemy. Because to be abandoned on the streets, when you used to call mom on a snowy night and 10 o'clock at night and you, you'd scrape, somebody would give you like 10 pence and you'd go to the call box and you'd call her and, you, and she answered the phone and go, hey mom, and she put the phone down. The abandonment that hits you stays with you for the rest of your life. You never get rid of that. But when I look back now, it was needed. It's like there's always pain before a new birth. And I realize why today. We need to know pain before we need to know how good we have life. I mean, my life is beyond my wildest dreams. Let's not even talk about the material things I have, which I'm one of the worst. I have so many material things, it's unreal. Only because I can afford them, not because I, I live above my means. There's no way. I like them. I enjoy them. I love it. But let's take away all that. It's the peace in my head that I've served. It's like serving in the army. I've served my time on the streets. I've paid my dues. I want them back now so I can continue to work with other people who are just as bad as me. Because I don't know about you, I'm dropped in a farm country somewhere. 
same speed. And I see this guy and go, hey, can you tell me where Johnson Street is? And the guy says, well, I've never been there. I don't know. I guess if you go up here and turn left and maybe second right, I'm not sure. I'm not getting to Johnson Street. He's never been there. How does he know how to get there? He's never been there. If I stop at the next guy on the stand and go, hey, can you tell me where Johnson Street? Oh, yeah. I, I lived there for a while. Let me tell you exactly how to get there. Because he's been there. It's the same with my journey. I'll show you how to get out of this alcoholic pit that, you've been, that you're in because I've been there. I know the way out. Hold my hand. Let me lead you out of this mess because we've already been there. And I'm telling you now, I guarantee that we'll walk out of it. For you at the moment, obviously, it's a gift because you've been able to use those learnings uh, to, 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 in many ways, connect with that space and understand your fellow human who's going through something similar. How does someone who's in that space who hasn't come out yet see that as a gift or is that something that comes later? It's something that definitely comes later, I think. Definitely later, but it will definitely come. You know, you, you, sometimes you have no idea. And all of a sudden when it pops up, you start to appreciate, it. you know, what's really, what's really going on. But I, I, I know when I, when, I, when I work with people now, like I said before, it's not about getting people well and male controls. I wanted to go out and succeed. I wanted to go out and do what I do. I wanted to go out and use their gifts that we passed on. Because I don't think I'm special and been chosen. I think that anybody I work with now, I like to pass the baton and say, this is your time now. Run with the gift that I've just given you from God that God gave me. Run with this gift and, and realize your full potential. And one of, the, one of the things we do as human beings is we never realize who we are. I say to my patients, if we could swap places for 10 minutes, all your problems would be over. Because you don't see what I see. And you don't see what the rest of the world sees. We see this broken image. Everybody's broken, guys. I don't care who you are. Sometime in your life you've been broken. And we all think everyone else is doing okay, but we're the only ones that are suffering. Everybody's suffering. Everybody's got complex. Everybody doesn't think they're good enough. One thing that I realized about seven or eight years ago is, and my life is at peace today. I'm never going to be tall enough. I'm never going to be blonde enough. I'm never going to be thin enough. And I'm never going to be rich enough. And as soon as I accepted that myself, life became a lot easier to open doors for other people because it's not about that today. It's about that gift. It's about that connection that you just talked about. It's about all these things in life that are awaiting us once we tread over that fear bridge and take that leap of faith. Some of the chronic alcoholics I work with now, I tell them categorically, this is the best thing you've ever done because your life from now will be passing on gifts and gifts and gifts to other people. And that's what it's about. All the TV, the radio, the books, my job, all that's great. It does feed my ego. I like to see me on TV and all that great stuff. I'm careful. I don't believe everything. I don't believe the hype. But I see it and it's nice. I always say that pays the mortgage and it keeps my wife happy. What I do is I'm with the boots on. I'm in the trenches with the guys who really need me. Whether you be a multimillionaire or whether you be a road sweeper, it makes no difference to me. I want to know where your mind is. I, a bottom drunk does not mean you have to go far as that down as I went. We picked a lady who, who her bottom was in a $10,000 a night suite in Hollywood, drinking $2,000 bot $2, bottles of champagne a night. That was her bottom. But to get them and bring them back and, and reunite them with families and reunite them with, with the disconnect that they've been in, it's something that I cannot put into words until this day. It's absolutely phenomenal. I've seen too many miracles for one human being. I'm sure I have. I'm sure when God took out the miracle bag and said, let's give everyone a miracle at least to see, they, they got lost and counted mine because I've seen too many. I've seen too many and life is amazing. Has this uh, sort of trait of yours helped you in your, 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 your recovery? You, you know, you're a high energy guy. Uh, I can certainly see that there's a, a real strong positivity around you. Uh, to me, it seems fairly reasonable that the flip side of that, you know, can be kind of extreme in the other end, which, you know, you, you, you described in some of those stories. Is this something that you've been able to harness for, for, for yourself? When you grab something, you don't tend to kind of go in halves. You, you, you seem to go the full hog, grab with two hands, embrace it, 
run with it. No mucking around. No, no half measures. Just grab it, go for it. Um, it it's all or nothing with me. It's always all or nothing. We go in a side, the alcoholic mind. Me and my friend goes into a sandwich shop. This is a true story. We're going in for lunch. I'm like, it's a stand-up one. You take it and, leave, and you leave. What do you want to eat? I'll have a sandwich. What else do you want? Uh, I'm good. I just want a sandwich. Okay. What do you want, Rob? I'll have a sandwich. Give me another sandwich in case. Give me a, uh, one of them. Give me two of them, one of them, and three of them. He's like, what are you doing? I, said, I don't know. I can't eat all of it, but that's just the way it is. I'm either all in or I'm all out. <laughs> and, and I can't help it. But that, that's the me with life. But, and there is a big but here now, so I'm so glad you had this question. There are times when, when it turns on me, there are times when I need to, to be motivated, you know, and I have a meeting I go to and I have a therapist I see once a week that really I go back to recharge my batteries because if somebody's happy all the time around you, all the time, 24 hours a day, just be careful. And I always say, people say, Rob, why are you always happy? Why are you always high energy? You know, your life is amazing. Are you always happy? And I'd say, well, follow me home. I'm not always happy. You see, my private life is my private life. And I suffer sometimes with depression. I suffer with not being good enough, you know. But that's not my persona when I come to help another human being. My persona, unless you're in a place to hear that, I'm not going to tell you I've been suffering today. I'm going to inspire you to get off of your backside and get your life back and get out there and make something of yourself and be proud. And I go back home and see my counselor and say, I'm falling to bits, please help me. You know, there is, a, there is a, a spin dark side to it. And I think there always will be. But that also Ness, keeps me humble. Mm-hmm. Say that, hey, I'm human. You know, I, I, had, a, I had a breakdown at PTSD. Seven years ago, I was taken into a hospital uh, for PTSD. And I stayed there for six weeks. And this is another thing that, that really I need to get into. This is why I've become a somatic experience practitioner. Is uh, the trauma that, that I went through never seemed like trauma to me, you know, and I had to learn about that. But I kept going and kept going and kept going and all of a sudden it hit me because I've not been looking after myself. And that's a big one with me. When I first got, when I first was helping people, I'd work with everyone I can, I can, help, I can work with, I just, whether to fail or not. Today, I just, I've got to look after myself first of all. So there is, there is a positive side to that, but there's also like a 2% negative side where I just have to be careful. You're obviously down somewhat of the path of recovery and I know that's a, you know, it's a day at a time each day. Uh, what would you say you're struggling with now? Uh, what, what are the sorts of things that are still difficult for you? Where's your suffering? I don't know where you're getting these questions from, but that's the third amazing question you just asked that nobody asks me. And I'm so glad you asked it. I haven't got an answer right away, but let me think about it. That is amazing. Where's my suffering today? Uh, my suffering is a little bit with, still with my, uh, my daughter. You know, we should have been there for us. Still trying to get over that a little bit. We just spoke this second before I got onto you. So that's awesome. Uh, I do suffer with uh, emotional, financial burden. Uh, and when I say that, uh, if I told you how much I had in my checking account and how much I have in my savings, you would go. You would look at me as if to go, "What's are you crazy?" But I, 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 I have nightmares about going broke. I have nightmares about going back to the streets. So I struggle with that today, and I think I would struggle, struggle, and be fearful of that for the rest of my life. And it doesn't matter how much money I have, how much wealth I include, how many people I work with, how much greatness I do in this world. I'm, I'm scared of them streets. I'm, I'm scared, and I still have nightmares today about waking up and this has all been a dream. I'm gonna wake up when I'm 25 on the side of a cold road, having just had another bender. And I'm scared to death of that. And I pinch myself and I punch myself and I try and get out of that horrible headspace because I just think one day it's gonna happen and how crazy is that? Wow. How much work do you do on yourself? Recently, I've been really careful. I started to see a counter about 12 months ago. And I do my daily stuff, which is I get up in the morning, I do my prayers, I do what I call mirror work. Um, I look at myself, I see what I can do today for the human being, not just alcoholic. 
I compliment three people a day. I do some readings a day. I do online meetings. I speak at meetings. I go to my own AA meetings. Um, I give a 10, 11, 12, which is going back through the day, every day, and going, where did I harm somebody? Could I have done better? Can you direct me tomorrow, God, to make sure that I help another alcoholic and do better? I make amends wherever I do harm immediately today. Even if I'm right or even if I'm wrong, that's the minimus. If there's an argument, I'm the first to turn around and say, let me apologize for that. I shouldn't have said that. But just recently, I've started journaling because I get very complacent. So I've started journaling. Uh, I've started being more accountable. And I'm taking time out to, to do some like, meditation, a little bit of yoga, and just try and make that connection a little bit stronger to what I think it is. Um, and I find when I do that, life is simple. Even though it, it's, like, it's bustling around me. You know, everyone's busy, everyone's doing this, nobody can get hold of me, no people, there's a waiting list to see me, but right here, I'm at peace today. And I'm lucky to have people around me to take care of all the day-to-day -day stuff. You know, I have no idea what I'm doing tomorrow. I really don't know. And Janet tonight at 9 p.m. will hand me my list for tomorrow, all my appointments. And then 10 minutes before that appointment's due, she sends an email. I click on it. It's the next client, next patient, next podcast, next interview, next TV thing. I click on it. Because I can only work one day at a time. That's all I can handle. Because my head wants to go to when I abandoned my children. My head wants to go to how my mom died a lot sooner than she should because of my homelessness and my disease. My head wants to go 20 years in the future to see what's going on, or tomorrow, or next week. And I just can't live like that. I, I do a 12-step program that keeps me today from, from committing suicide from the stuff that I did to my children and my wife and my family and my friends and me, to me as well. I keep forgetting that, the damage done to me. I've had to forgive that little kid inside that I damaged terribly um, as, a, as a late teenager and early 20s with the alcohol and, and the behavior. And today I have to watch that internal dialogue. It's very important to me. So if I drop a pen off on the floor, I used to be a stupid idiot. Oh, what a fool, what a clown. I'm not anymore. I've just dropped a pen on the floor, pick it up, I'll smile and carry on. And I tell this to other people. I've found out over the years that words are more powerful than we can ever think. We had a nursery rhyme at school. You probably had it where you are, a nursery. It sticks in the stones will break my bones, but words will never hurt. And that, that nursery rhyme used to be rife in England. And it's not true. You know, we had, we, had a, uh, we had an incident here a couple of years ago where I'd finished with a patient called John L, uh, shook hands and off he went home. And about 20 minutes later, my secretary come in and said, oh my goodness, John L's father's died in a car accident. They called here, they can't get hold of him. So he's dead, you know, can you call him? So I called John L up and I'm, I'm telling him and you can hear him crying and he's pulled over to the side of the road and he's, He's lost all control over his body. He's shaking, he's crying, he's sweating. Yeah, I think he peed himself a little bit. It was just horrible. I mean, the mess, and fancy hearing that, you know, when you're driving home. So I, I, I wished him well. I said I'd call him when he got home. I put the phone down and my secretary burst through the door. She didn't even knock. And she says, oh my God, Dr. Rob, we've got the wrong John. It's John B, not John L, whose father's died. So I said, oh my goodness, you called John B, I'll call John L back. So I called him back. He stood at the side of the road, can't move, paralyzed with fear. And I called him and said, listen, we've got a terrible mistake. We've got the wrong one. It's John B. It's not John L. I explained all this stuff. And he was okay. He put the phone down. But after I put the phone down, it made me think that only through my words, on the end of a telephone, was I able to completely destroy his body, his feelings, his, his control of any emotion. And it was just words. There was no truth in that. There was nothing. It was just words on the end of the telephone. So I'm careful what I say today to people. I'm careful what I listen to. I won't be drawn into any conversation. Oh, we're all mad in here. Some of the 12-step rooms I go to, I put my hand up and go, please don't include me in that. If you want to see madness, come back 30 years ago. Let me show you madness. Today, I'm, I can't listen to that stuff because my brain will react on that and think it's okay to start acting that way. And I can't do that. 
talk a little bit about forgiveness uh, and, 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 and these words. You, you somewhat kind of connected those, the, 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 those two. Can you tell me a little bit about, about that? Forgiveness for me, the first thing I had to forgive, or the first person I had to forgive was myself. I had to forgive myself before, just like I had to love myself or I couldn't love anybody else. So I had to forgive myself from, not from going through what I went and the damage I caused. I had to forgive myself from still carrying that later on in life after I've recovered. Forgive myself that I'm living with this torment and torture and, and still trying to do more damage internally with internal dialogue. I'm also forgiving of everybody around me and everything around me. I have to be today because I often say, especially with the company, somebody makes a mistake, it's a mistake. Somebody makes a mistake twice, learn from that. If you mistake three times, there's no forgiving that. You know, listen, watch your body, watch your movements, watch your actions, all this stuff. But it had to begin with me. And, and that was a hard one for me because I couldn't see what I had to be forgiven for. First of all, I was very angry when I finally got sober. I was very angry and I was very um, misguided and I was very uh, disconnected. And all that came at once at the age of 28 and I had to fix all that together again. So it's, it's been a gradual, over the years, and I'm still not there now, Mitch, I'm still not there. Uh, progress not perfection I'm getting there on a daily basis and I'm still forgiving myself and I'm still forgiving everything that's happened and people around me and circumstances and, and it's just the way it is you know people I've, I have deep conversations with people I can trust and they go well, you know we look at you Rob and you just got it made that's what they used to say to me got it made how you know I mean well you've got this you've got that you're at, pay. at what price though it was only 18 months ago that my eldest daughter contacted me on Facebook after 25 years and said, Dad, I want to see you. 25 years of crying every Christmas and every birthday, every Father's Day. Just sad. Up until two years ago, when the birthday came around, I'd cry because my daughter, my eldest daughter, I knew she was out there. You know, I'm probably struggling from the same thing I am. Then 18 months ago, she got in contact with me. I went over to England, held her for the first time, held my granddaughter, who was one, for the first time. I just, I just finished paying for my daughter to go back to college, go back to school, and she's now a drug and alcohol counsellor. How cool is that? She graduated last oh, week. Yeah. yeah. How All do you know about repairing these relationships, particularly, you know, these are the closest connections relationships you know you, you, you i'm sure you know personally as well how important family are how do you go about repairing that after so many years and all the things that have happened you know <clears throat> it's nerve-wracking to start with just the thought of, of being connected again or reconnected with mom with dad with with brother sister uh, daughters um i think I think to come from a place of love and peace. When, I'm at, when, I, when, I, when I love myself and I'm at peace with myself, I think that carries when I go back to make my amends, I go back to build them bridges, you know, make the connections. And I'm not expecting anything of anybody. I'm not expecting everyone, oh, well, thanks, Rob, and oh, that's no problem. You know, I've forgotten about it now. I'm not doing that. I, I always say, judge me by my actions and not by my intentions today. You know, because I was like a contagious disease. I infected everybody I'd come into contact with, with my alcoholism, one way or another. And the damage I've done is unthinkable. And any alcoholic who's been through what I've been knows exactly what I'm talking about. But we can only do it one piece at a time. We can only do it one day at a time. We can only do one love at a time. You know, these bridges that I'm building, my sister, 20 years, never spoke. We have daily conversations now. My brother, who, who's not come around yet, and, and may never do, nothing I can do about that. And I kind of I do what I have to do on my side of the street, and I don't worry about the other person's side of the street. I can only do what i got to do. See, the thing is, I can't change anything about the past, but I can sure change something about the future and the present. I can be that person. And I don't expect to slip in, in my daughter's life 
where I left off. I mean, that's not possible. It's not even feasible. Why would I want to do that? But that's the human instinct to do. No, dad's been away for 25 years. Dad didn't see your birthdays and graduations and, you know, first boyfriend. I mean, dad wasn't there to do that. I need to recognize that. We both need to recognize that, that there's a big chunk out of our life and we need to do this slowly. And I'm not expecting nothing and I will give everything I can. See, the first one is there was because I'm wealthy now was to buy everyone's affection back. You know, if I bought my, my daughter this or, you know, bought her a car and a pony and I went, I mean, I'm going to be okay. And, you know, that was painful for me because I tried to do that at first. And it was the wrong thing to do because my daughter, I always remember saying to me, you know, I always tried to provide for my daughters. The order of the best clothes, we lived in the best houses. I dropped her off at school in the best Mercedes cars. They didn't want that. They didn't even know what that was. They didn't want a million dollar house. They wanted dad to spend 15 minutes at nighttime reading them a bedtime story. And dad was too drunk to do that. But he still thought he was providing well. And these are the little things. You know, I spoke to a friend of mine the other day and was, was looking through some old photographs. And we found a photograph of me and him when we were like six or seven. Stood outside mum and dad's house with our best coats on or something. And we stood there all proud with this black and white photograph. And he said to me, God, do you remember them days? Or they, those were the days, Rob, weren't they? And it got me thinking, what if today was one of those days? Why can't today be one of those good days? So in 10 or 20 years back, what if we realize now? Because we never did then. We never realized that those were the days. We never thought of that. But what if today's one of those days? So why not get up in the morning? Why not start inspiring people? Why not go out with a smile on your face and do good stuff to people? Like I'll be traveling down the street and I'll look at the corner, I'll see some woman, you know, with like six kids in the car and you can see us trying to squeeze out five dollars worth of gas. I'm turning around, I'm going over there and I'm paying for the gas, I'm giving her some money. You know, I'm helping the old lady. I mean, whatever I see is what I'm doing because giving back is where the joy is today. And God will take care of the rest. You know, is that, is that part of your, is that part of your recovery, that lifestyle of giving to keep you on track, to keep yeah. you, uh, apologies if this is the wrong, wrong word. And I'm, I'm sure it is, but it's the first one that comes to mind, but you know, to keep you, sane and settled and and um you know stable is, is is to continue to look at others to to provide to serve um to to, to try and help it's that i think you use the word mission um before that you, you, you've been on a mission for 27 years is that is this yeah. is this what kind of keeps you you know where you are um you know in in in, in along your your journey I think so, yeah. I mean, there's a couple of reasons why I do it. One, because it makes me feel good. Uh, and it does. It does make me feel good when I can, I, can, I can afford to do that. Or even if it's walking someone across the road. I like to say to others, look, you know, I'll stop my car in the middle of the road and get out of my car. And I walk over to the guy in the corner and I'll like, give him $20 or whatever. And I want to see what else doing next. If I can do it, you get your ass and do it. Because people don't do this for fun, you know. But it also, there's little things in my mind. And I can remember sat outside the store once and I was starving to death and I wouldn't go in and steal. But the woman came out and she said, I'll be back in 20 minutes. And I knew I'd never see her again. And she came back next. She came back with food and drinks and hot coffee and stuff like that. And, and that's where I always put myself, you know, I want to be that lady. I want to be that guy that stopped on the street at 2.30 in the morning and said to me, do I want help? I want to be that guy that gave me 10, 20 pounds that time when I couldn't afford alcohol and I was going to die. I want to be that guy. I don't want to be recognized. I don't take photographs of it on Facebook. I just want somebody one day to go, oh, remember that guy, that English guy who stopped and helped me? Remember that guy? That's all I want, you know, because whether it's my duty or not, it's the minimus. It's something that I have to do because when everybody had given up on me, this, this one person didn't. And without that one person, you know, I used to hear in 12-step rooms, don't mess with Rob Kelly. He's just going to die. He's beyond help. I used to hear that. Hear that. Can you imagine the abandonment that went with that? So when one person helped me, I just swore it with my pact with God that for the rest of my life I'm going to work with his kids. And that's part of the deal for me. You know, is if I can walk away and you have a smile on your face, my job's done. I don't want any thanks for it. I don't want any, you know, write a letter to his or give a compliment or put me on face. Not any of that. It's just what I do. 
because I, I, I'm the only person I know that gets got two lives in my lifetime. I should be dead. I tried to commit suicide six times on two occasions it worked. I died on the streets for a minute and 90 seconds. And he brought me back to life on, on, on the side of the streets. I shouldn't even be here. So why wouldn't I do these great things? Does it keep me sober? I have no idea. Does it make me a better person? I have no idea. I just know that when I was there, somebody did it for me. And I want to be that somebody. And that's all I want in life. I just want someone to go, remember that English guy? How he helped us that time. Like tomorrow, some two, two patients we work with, we've got the one year anniversary tomorrow. So I'm taking him skydiving because that was on the bucket list. Let's go skydiving. Cost a bloody fortune. Why am I doing it? I know, why not? They're gonna, they're gonna always say, remember that time I went skydiving? Remember that picture, remember those days? You know, 10 years from now, remember them? I, I wanna be part of those days. I wanna be part of those days with people. Tell me a little bit about the Rob Kelly Recovery Group. What do you guys do? Rob Kelly Recovery Group was a company I started some years ago, but really got strong when I started coming to the UK, uh, USA 14 years ago. Uh, we, look at, we look at addiction differently. Uh, we only take on four clients at any one time. So we've like an SAS team around you. We change neural pathways. We change the way you think. We also repair damage done in the mind going back. We also help put families back together again. If you come to us and you've lost your job, we'll get you another one before you leave us. We'll get you that girlfriend. We'll put you in that position that your life is amazing. And this is what we do. The alcohol and drugs is a given. It's a given. You, you, we'll stop that the first week you come in. It's not about the alcohol and drugs. It's the way you feel about yourself. And we can change that. So basically, that's what we do. We like to say we've been reuniting families for the last 20-something years um, because that's what it's about. We get people back together work, and we get people's lives back. So it's an, it, it's quite an intensive group where it, it, it's uh, yeah, several, it is. It's uh, well, it, one. it's all one on one. We don't have groups. It's all one on one, and it's uh, you spend an hour a day with me. Ninety nine percent of our work is telehealth. We've been doing telehealth for the last eight years, so we're kind of pioneers of telehealth. It's an hour a day for ninety days. You spend five days personally with me, and two days with my psychotherapist, and then you have a team around you. You have, uh, you've got to do check-ins every day. You've got to do homework every day. You've got to be accountable every day. And uh, breath tests and drug tests and everything that we do. But uh, we're building your confidence on a daily basis. And you basically have a, a team of five people around you at any one time that you can use either direct by Zoom or FaceTime. So you've all got somebody with you all the time to work with you. And all of my guys that work for me are recovered alcoholics and addicts. All of them have been to the depth. They've either been in prison and you've come out and you've turned the life around, something amazing, uh, or they've been through lots of children. So the have <clears throat> in one of them. Now, the only person that hasn't been through it is my wife, Janet, which, who runs all the back office. Uh, but she had a brother um, who was an alcoholic who left her one day, big smiles and everything, only to go back and, and uh, shoot herself in the head. So she's connected there to that horrible you know, lifestyle of what, what's going on. You know, the, the disease, it's, it's more intense than we think it is. So everybody has experience. So when you call in, um, everybody knows what you're going through. And I think that helps. We're all, even though we have to act as coaches when we cross state lines, uh, I'm a psychologist. Most of my guys are master counselors, psychotherapists, is a doctor. Uh, we, we are the best of the best that I've, I've uh, pulled around me to create this team that will fight toe-to-toe with your addiction until you're set free. What's next for you? I would like uh, to build a treatment center in, in Texas, maybe San Antonio, 300 bed treatment center for people that I can't afford treatment. So we want it funding by all the big guys around, all the big companies, maybe some of the liquor, store, liquor companies around to fund this project in San Antonio, Texas, to have one of the biggest rehabilitation centers in the world around. When I say 300 beds, that's not a lot. But what I mean is within that complex to have a housing unit in that complex, to have a clothes shop that will fit you out free with clothes, uh, to have a, a, a car auto place that will give you a loan on your first car, to have a job center that will find you your first job. So like a mini city in the middle of San Antonio that's going to just leave uh, a legacy of everything that I am 
and everything that I strive to be on a daily basis. And uh, I think it'll happen. I really do. Trying to build a community. Yes. Yeah. Because it's, it's not a dirty disease. It's a misunderstanding disease. Alcoholism is the only self-diagnosed illness in the world. Once you diagnose yourself, that needs to be help. It needs to get away from stigma, you know. Some of the best people I know are alcoholics and addicts. Some of the best people I've met in the film industry. Some of the biggest stars and acts in the world are alcoholics and addicts. No one needs to know. Great people. Some of my postmen, the milkman, you know, the guy who delivers stuff. You see them in AA meetings. It's all great stuff, but great people. You just need to be given a chance. Is addiction universal? I know that obviously alcoholism is, is something that you've got lived experience with and have worked with. Is, is other addiction the same? Well, you know, whether yes, it's you know, I AA or yeah. NA? Yeah, it's all a 12 step program. It's all there to help the person. It's phenomenal. Uh, any way you can get well is good with me. So it is universal. Uh, therapy, alcoholism, addiction, NA, AA, SA, CA, all them great. Uh, uh, places are all great to go to, all great part of my recovery, part of other people's recovery. And I think the more we grow, the easier it will get to, uh, to out. See, I, I don't out myself. My anonymity does not exist. You know, I only go search my name and you can say exactly who I am, what I do, and what I suffer from, what I suffer from. But uh, I, I respect everyone else's anonymity. But yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's universal. Why is the anonymity so important? I think, <clears throat> I think because at the first it's embarrassing to people. Um, they don't want to bump into anybody that they know, even though if they did, they'd be in the same situation as you were. So it, wouldn't work, you know, it doesn't make a difference. But I think the first step, because it's, uh, it's an underground illness still, the first step has to be anonymous because just dialogue with somebody will get you started on the right path. And that's all we need. Whether you want to come out later or you help somebody else, you know, that's up to you. But first of all, I think it needs to be done. It's like a visit to the doctor when you have something that you don't really want to talk about. You know, we need places to go and go, hey, have you seen this? And someone go, oh, yeah, wow, these five people have got the exact same thing as you. Come on, let's talk about it. It's like we speak a different language, you know, so it's, it's very important. Self-care. I know that a lot of this is, is around a lifestyle what, what what are the self-care measures that you take how, how do you wind down how do you enjoy life when when, when you're not you know in your in your busy world what, what do you do well we have a we have self-care friday at work where you know everybody has to go for a, a, a massage or go for the nails done or whatever my me myself uh, i have a music room i have because i used to be a musician i guess i still am so i play a lot of music i write a lot of music uh, I have four English Bulldogs that keeps us very busy. We start off with two and uh, my wife says, can we get one more? She'll come back with two. Uh, so we have them that keep us busy. And uh, just relaxing, have a beautiful wife, have a beautiful home, we have a great pool. And we spend a lot of time in the back cooking out and just chilling out and having friends over and just enjoying life. And I think, uh, I think, I think I stopped to smell the roses quite often today. And, and that's pretty cool. But it's, I, keep, I, keep, I still have a therapist uh, for self-care and I still have people I can bounce stuff off for self-care. But if I'm not kind to myself, complacency will get me sooner or later. And if complacency gets me, I'm going to relapse. And if I relapse, Nash, all this is gone. All of it's gone. I, 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 I can't even imagine it. So fear is not going to keep me sober. So what do I do? I have to look after myself. And it's these things like the massages at home and, and the pool and the dogs and the music and my wife and, you know, close friends. It's just, it's all part of the deal. I, I, I need to look after me because at the end of the day, there's only one of me. How do you feel about relapse? How, um, I mean, obviously everyone goes... <laughs> Uh, maybe, maybe not everyone, but the, certainly the vast, vast, vast majority uh, of people trying to move out, out of addiction, go through you know, lapses and relapses. Uh, how do you feel about that? Is that something that's always close to the surface? Do, do you feel like you're further away at times, that you're 
you know, playing with danger at other times. I know that you're, you're certainly down you know, further in your journey, but do, do you still find yourself creeping toward, toward that line at times? I think it's always going to be there. Anybody that relapses, uh, obviously remorse, guilt and shame comes up straight away the day after. I always tell him this could be the best thing you've ever done in your life. I don't recommend it to anybody, but your last relapse is the one you remember. So it's part of the disease. It's not part of the solution, as we like to say. So once we get you into the program, once you start making choices for yourself around different behaviors, see the signs to look for with alcoholism. Alcoholism will never come to me on a Monday and go, hey, Rob, let's have a drink today. It doesn't work like that. It's a week or even a month before when my attitude starts to change. When Billy in the corner of the office is still using and that stupid Christmas pen that his mum bought for him two years ago, or Jenny in the corner is still wearing that crazy, you know, blue skirt that everybody says she looks fat in. Yes, and it's all these niggly bits that I want to niggle about. That's my relapse. But once I spot that, alcohol will never come in a Monday and go, let's drink, because I've spotted it already. So it's part of the disease, without a doubt. I relapse more times than I can mention, and, it, and it's horrible. But if you can learn something every time you relapse, it's a good thing. It's a good thing. So a lot of this also in terms of the work that you're doing is always about noticing flags, noticing yourself, recognizing, be, being that sort of internal observer. You know, where am I at? What am I feeling? Why am I feeling that? So you can see things ahead of time rather than being ambushed, so to speak. Definitely. Uh, knowledge of the disease is nine tenths of the law where I come from. If you know about your disease, I often go into places now and I say, tell me what an alcoholic is. And the answer is always the same. It's somebody who drinks too much alcohol. And it could be furthest from the truth. That's not the case. You know, it goes much deeper than that. It's all to do with the mind, not the bottle. So it's important that, that we know that. And it's important that we understand that. And the understanding of any, any, any illness that you have, you stand a better chance of trying to trying to get well from it because if i don't have a full knowledge of my condition and i don't know what to look for you know when i am in the mood when i am down when i am irritable all these signs my body is telling me something isn't right so let's change that before it gets up to the prefrontal cortex because once it gets there all bets are off there's no turning back for those people who don't know the prefrontal cortex has one job in the world his only job is to come up with a solution as fast as possible. And for that, it does an amazing job, nine times out of ten. The only is for the alcoholic and the drug addict, the solution is always to take drugs and drink alcohol. The other people, it's not so. They may take a different route as the sensible one. But prefrontal cortex of the alcoholic brain is dangerous. We don't want it to get there. It will end in disaster every time. So knowledge, knowledge, knowledge of your disease. It's very important. You stand a fighting chance once you know. For those listeners who have a loved one, someone they dearly care about who is going through addiction themselves, is having a difficult time, what advice do you have for them? What, what can they do? First of all, the most important thing is, guys, is dialogue. Call somebody. Call anybody and start that dialogue. Whether you think your loved one is suffering or, or the signs, call somebody. Talk to them. Talk to us. Talk to anybody. Talk to the people you think have a problem. Talk to it lovingly. You know, there, there's dialogue is the best thing we can do. And then do some research. But be careful when you research, obviously, because uh, the internet is a wide place and everything on there is not real or truthful. So be careful. And, you know, everyone knows who I am. RobKelly.com is the website. Go on there. Give me a call. Give my staff a call. Hey, can you tell me about this? Is that a cost you anything? We'll give you the truth. We'll tell you where to go, how to do it, if you're in trouble, what to look for. So it's just about connection. Because what people do is they tend to sweep it under the carpet and go, well, it can't, you know, it's not, it's not a real problem yet. It's a bit like having a child. You're never going to be ready to say it's a problem. It will creep up on you so quick. It's either de minimis or it's a huge problem. Let's cut that out. Let's find it in the middle. Talk to somebody. Start dialogue with whoever you need to do. Once it starts to come open, once you start shining light on anything that's dark, the truth comes to the top every time. And it's nothing to be ashamed of. If you're going through it and you're in the position I was, 
or if you have, think you have a drink or drug problem, it's nothing to be ashamed of. This is, a, this is an illness. You have no control over it once it gets out of hand. Let's stop it get from how, out of hand. And you can recover from this. I guarantee you. I think that's a beautiful place to leave it at, compassionate dialogue and communication. It's uh, what's, what's very much needed to, to help anyone in pain. And, and uh, obviously, that, 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 that's integral you know, for that first step. So I think uh, very, very beautifully summarized, uh, Rob, at the end. Really appreciate your time, Rob. I, I'd love to be able to, uh, you know, stay on this call for, you know, five, six hours. Uh, you know, we could kind of go into every, every sort of uh, corner of the room about addiction and alcoholism and, you know, how people get in there and, and, and the like, but it's been an absolute pleasure um, and, 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 you know, really appreciate your candidness and openness about your own story as well. And I think that's what really I think is, is needed so that we don't keep people isolated and separated, but rather you know, invite them and say, you belong, you know, there's nothing wrong with you. This is something that we can do together to, to make, make you, you know, uh, better and, and, and embrace more of life, make life richer. So thank you very much, Rob. Absolutely, my pleasure, Nash. It was great being on. I really enjoyed it. And uh, three questions that nobody have asked. That's awesome. I love that. All the best as well with building that community. I want to hear about that more in, in the future. So, you know, good luck with that. Thank you so much. Talk again. If you enjoyed this podcast, please support it by going to iTunes and putting a review. Subscribe. Share it via social media. And tell others about it. Start a conversation. It's listeners like you that make this able and possible and why we bring in these guests to go out and share their knowledge and resources. And just lastly, if you are a psychologist and you want to go out and be part of a bigger team, develop your experience and get into some exciting work, come to strategicpsychology.com.au forward slash careers and reach out. I'd love to hear from you.